Today is August 27th, 2023. I want to talk about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. I want to talk about the ongoing Ukrainian offensive, now nearing almost three full months of combat operations. I want to start by taking a look at the map. This is liveuamap.com. It is a pro-Ukrainian map, so keep that in mind as we look at it. You can see that Ukraine continues to carry out these drone strikes with inside Russia. Previously, there had been attacks on Crimea. There had been an airfield where a Tupolev Tu-22M3 long-range bomber was apparently damaged or destroyed. So Ukraine is carrying out these attacks, but we'll get into this a little bit later and see if this is actually having any sort of impact. Uh, there is this right here. Two Ukrainian L-39 fighter jets crashed midair in the Zidomor region, killing three pilots. I'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. And then let's look at the line of contact itself. Robotny right here. We just heard a, a flurry of news articles talking about how Ukraine has finally taken this. But this map has shown Robotny taken by Ukrainian forces for weeks now. Obviously, they, they did not take it when this map claimed that they did, and they never bothered to undo that. And that's why I tell you to keep in mind that this is a pro-Ukrainian map. But still, it is a pro-Ukrainian map, and this is all the progress they're showing Ukraine having made. They are trying, they're at three months now. They started here. And this is where they are now, allegedly. They still need to get to here, or here, Mletopol, or even down here, Crimea, or maybe Mariupol over here. And you could see how, how hopeless this is for Ukraine. And meanwhile, and I'll go over some articles from the Western media about this, Russia continues fighting hard in the East, they are conducting what appears to be one of their methodical grinding offensive operations toward Kopyansk. And the, the fighting around Bakhmut for Ukraine has stalled. They, they, at one point, they had been making progress. They're no longer making progress. And the United States is trying to pressure Ukraine to abandon its operations in the East altogether and send everything to the South, try to make some sort of breakthrough of these Russian defenses and I've explained many times how even if they reach the Sea of Azov, this is a war of attrition, they will have traded their entire army in for territory that they will no longer be able to hold. Well, not their whole army, but their offensive capabilities. And we'll get into that also. I want to start with this article from the Wall Street Journal. Ukraine chalks up small advance in southern push. This was August 22nd. 2023 so very recently and these are these articles from the western media claiming that ukraine now has robotny but looking at it online it doesn't really seem like that is confirmed yet so this will be the second time they've claimed robotny has been taken by ukraine uh, but it has has yet to be confirmed the article says ukrainian forces said they had seized the village of robotny taking another small step in kiev's efforts to cut through russian defenses in southern ukraine robotny's capture by ukraine's 47th mechanized brigade gives kiev something to celebrate after two months of hard fighting now it's almost three months substantial casualties and minimal gains since the long-awaited counter-offensive began there is nothing to celebrate they have traded almost all of their offensive capabilities or offensive potential to get this this town that is still actually in the security zone uh, if we go to this article as a matter of fact you scroll down and we have we're gonna have to zoom in very close they give you a map this is where they started or kiev or uh, or Kov, and now they claim they're at robotny so here to here they they still have to get to Tokmak, maletopol and then the sea of Vezov. this is at three months, this is all they've managed to take. And they're going to talk about the catastrophic losses that they've suffered. Let's continue. About nine miles south of Orkiv, where Ukrainian forces began their march south, the Robotny is within 14 miles of Tokmak, a key crossroads on the way south toward Baletopol, which is the biggest Russian-occupied city in the Zaporozhye region. Kiev is hoping its troops can reach the Sea of Azov during the counter 
counteroffensive and bisect Russian forces. Sounds like a great way to just get your forces surrounded. I, I don't think they're going to be able to op operationally isolate any Russian forces, even if they were to achieve that. And I've explained many times how doing this, and even if they manage to also destroy the Crimean Bridge, Crimea can still be supplied by air and ship. Uh, militarily, they will still be able to sustain combat operations. They have been doing so in Syria since 2015. They do not have bridges or railroads uh, to use to send troops and supplies to Syria. They don't need it to do so. They don't need it to do so in Crimea, which is much closer. The article continues. It says, these Ukrainian troops are being sent to something we'd never do, launching a counteroffensive without total air superiority, said Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commander of the U.S. Army in Europe. Uh, this is the same Ben Hodges who, who claimed the offensive was going to cut straight through Russian defenses, it would be a resounding victory. They would be in Crimea by summer. Now, that clearly is not happening. Not, not by summer. Days ago, after months of pleas from Ukraine for fighter jets, the U.S. agreed to let allies transfer F-16s to Kiev, and the Netherlands and Denmark collectively pledged to send more than 60 of them. However, those jets aren't expected to arrive in months. In reality, and I'll get into this a little more, uh, later, it will take years to properly integrate these and be able to use them effectively. Ukraine does not have years. And even if all 60 of these warplanes were sent, somehow they could find pilots for all of them and they could actually operate them effectively, they still would not create anything close to resembling air superiority. For the same reason why Ukraine actually did have an air force when Russia began its special military operation, and now it does not have an air force. Russia has a bigger air force, a more capable air force, even more capable than anything these F-16s will allow Ukraine to do. They also have the best air defenses in the world, and that is according to Western analysts. The article starts to talk about uh, this 47th Brigade and the losses that they've sustained. The counteroffensive began disastrously for the 47th Brigade, one of Ukraine's newly formed units, which was provided with Western tanks and trained in Europe this spring. And I. I warned months ago that these NATO trained and equipped brigades would would perform disastrously in combat. There's not nearly enough time to put these brigades together properly, train them properly, and have them effectively fight on a battlefield. That was impossible, and I think we could all see that demonstrated in full as part of Ukraine's offensive. The article continues, at the start of June, as the brigade pushed south from Orakiv, a number of its Western armored vehicles were trapped in minefields, some were lost. In the months since, Kiev has adjusted its tactics with infantry now leading the charge through minefields on foot, and tanks supporting them from behind, according to soldiers uh, in several brigades fighting in the area. The arrival of American cluster munitions has also boosted the offensive, soldiers said. It's a very big price, he said. And they're uh, interviewing these soldiers involved. Lots of injuries, lots of new people, not a lot of time to prepare. Now, in reality, they're talking about these cluster munitions. These are 155 millimeter rounds. Uh, and this was so that Ukraine had more artillery ammunition to fire because they didn't have enough conventional rounds, high explosive rounds, the rounds that they actually need. They don't have enough of those. They sent them these cluster munitions because it's the only thing they have left that they could shoot out of their howitzers. That's why they sent them. They're not even as effective. They're less effective than high explosive rounds, especially for targeting fortified positions. This is just to give them a little more time on the clock to perform the operation because, uh, again, before the before the offensive began, myself, Alexander Mikuris of the Duran, we, I think we agreed more or less that it, they were probably going to have two to three months of artillery ammunition surged into Ukraine by NATO for use for the offensive specifically. And then after that, there would be very little left in Western stockpiles, and they would have to depend on what they're able to produce month to month, which is not much. The article continues. It says, at the start, we thought we could take our fist and hit them with all our strength. And we almost broke our hand, one soldier from the 47th Brigade said recently. 
He added that the brigade has gained experience, especially with the mining, and is proceeding more methodically, but taking heavy casualties. If you remember that this is a war of attrition and not a, a, a war of territorial conquest, then he is describing a process of trading in their military, their manpower and their equipment for meager gains in territory, which at the end of the day are meaningless. If they take a little bit of territory or a lot of territory, but they have no army left to defend it at the end of the offensive, and Russia is able to preserve its manpower and equipment, they will be in a stronger position than Ukraine, and Ukraine will be in a weaker position than when they started the offensive, which seems to defeat the whole purpose. But why they're doing this, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at a little closer in just a moment. The article continues. It says the Tu-22M3 backfire bomber that was likely hit has uh, been used to fire inaccurate anti-ship missiles against Ukraine, the ministry wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter. So they're talking about these, these long-range attacks, these drone attacks that Ukraine is carrying out inside of Russia. And they're trying to add this to give some sort of balance to the, the very bad news of the Ukrainian offensive faring so poorly. It continues, it says, this is at least the third successful attack on long-range aviation airfields. Again, raising questions about Russia's ability to protect strategic locations deep inside the country, the ministry wrote. But if this is the third attack in a year and a half, and let's just assume in all three attacks, uh, one or two, maybe even three bombers were destroyed. When you add all of that up, considering how many bombers Russia has, the fact that they're still capable of manufacturing more, strategically, this is irrelevant. This is to distract away from the fact that the offensive is a failure. As I pointed out in previous updates, and as other analysts have pointed out, including the Duran, Alex Christoforou, and Alexander Mikuris, they do daily daily updates on the on the conflict in Ukraine and much more. Uh, so if you're in between my updates and you you want more information, they do daily daily videos. Please check them out. Uh, there have been many articles from the Western media explaining the reality of the offensive, that it is that it is failing and that a lot of the things that this same Western media told the public before is not actually true. Uh, they're starting to come to grips with reality. There's this article, also a couple of days older. U.S.-Ukraine clash over counteroffensive strategy. Kiev's forces can still break through Russia defenses, but time is running out, Washington officials say. I, I actually don't think that that is true. They, they could break through Russian defense lines, but at this point, it doesn't matter because they have nothing to exploit a breakthrough with. It says U.S. and Ukrainian officials have been engaged in an intense behind the scenes debate for weeks over the strategy and tactics for reviving Kiev's slow moving counteroffensive. You cannot revive a, an offensive in the middle of the offensive. Considering that the things you need to do to prepare for an offensive can take weeks or months and in some cases years. They're, they're, are things that you would have had to do years ago if you wanted Ukraine to be successful in this offensive. And Ukraine didn't do these things. The US and Europe did not do these things. And this includes military industrial output, expanding it. American military officials have been urging the Ukrainians to return to the combined arms training they received at allied bases in Europe by concentrating their forces to try to burst through Russia defenses and push to the sea of Azov. Uh, I have been saying for many months before the offensive began, and as now the Western media is admitting, the idea of NATO training Ukrainian conscripts to do combined arms warfare with NATO equipment that they have no experience operating or maintaining, this whole notion was an absolute fantasy. It was so unrealistic, it was almost hard to believe that they were proposing it in the first place. And we can see the results of that playing out on the battlefield right now. So we have to ask ourselves if NATO-style maneuver warfare 
And as Lieutenant General Ben Hodges points out, without air superiority, if this is so futile, why does the U.S. insist that they go back to this? Uh, that is, that is uh, an important question that we have to try to answer. The article discusses NATO training and it says the U.S. and its partners have trained more than 70,000 Ukrainian soldiers at more than 40 training areas. But the crux of the U.S. combined arms training in Germany was on 14 motorized infantry, mechanized and National Guard battalions, some 8,000 troops who are to push through Russia's lines or secure terrain. They have failed to do either so far. The 12-week training program for those battalions included instruction on using their artillery, mechanized units, and infantry together. It culminated in a week-long battalion-level exercise with Ukrainian forces squared off against a mock adversary played by U.S. forces. 12 weeks is three months. Three months is not even uh, long enough to produce a basic entry-level infantryman for the U.S. Marine Corps. Marine Corps basic training is three months, then you do another two months of infantry training. So these Ukrainian troops didn't even get enough training to become basic infantrymen, let alone operate as a battalion or a brigade conducting NATO style maneuver warfare, combined arms warfare with their NATO equipment that they've never used before. This this was impossible. There was no way to achieve this. It was outright impossible. The article says two additional battalions, one National Guard and one Armored, are also undergoing training. I guess they're still training right now. The latter is equipped with 31 Abrams tanks and will be deployed in the fall, along with armored vehicles to breach minefields and combat engineering equipment, said Colonel Martin O'Donnell, a U.S. Army spokesman, in Europe. So these 31 Abrams tanks and the, these other armored vehicles to breach minefields, they'll be arriving right as whatever Ukraine has left is, is finally destroyed. Do you see what the problem is? They are, they are trickling this equipment in in the middle of an offensive that is already catastrophically failing. The training is intended to enable Ukrainian forces to break through their foes defenses and maneuver in the Russia's rear area, but without the advantages of US military has long enjoyed, especially air power. That is the key to understanding why Ukraine failed so badly. Clearly there was not enough training, not nearly enough training to create a combined arms force capable of doing this. And then even if they did have the proper training, which would require actually uh, one, two, maybe three years, maybe more. They don't have air power. They don't have air defenses. They don't have uh, enough long-range fires in the in the form of rockets, missiles, howitzers. So there was absolutely no way for them to breach Russian minefields without suffering catastrophic losses in men and equipment. Then the article acknowledges, when America fights with combined arms, it fights with battlefield air superiority, said Philip Breedlove, a retired U.S. Air Force general who served as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's top military commander from 2013 to 2016. Ukraine doesn't have that, nor have we given Ukraine long-range precise artillery, he added. So when there is all this talk that they are failing with combined arms, we need to look in the mirror. That's what I said in my, my last update. I said that this was NATO's failure. This was not Ukraine's failure. Although in a, in a sense, it's Ukraine's leadership's failure because they have, they have invested their country and their people in this losing proposition, this proxy war the US is waging against Russia using Ukraine. So where, where's everything going? Where are things right now and where are things going? At the same time, the offensive drags on. We have articles like this from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. This is US government funded media. Russia reinforcing troops ahead of renewed offensive in tense east. Ukrainian general says, not only is Ukraine's offensive culminating and uh, exhausting itself right now, as we talk, Russia is on the offensive right now in the northeast around Kopyansk. And this was one of the areas that Ukraine took from Russia during the Kharkov offensive. 
And now there is a reversal. There is a reversal in Russia's favor in the middle of Ukraine's offensive. That bodes very poorly for, for Ukraine. The article, this is what the article says. After a month of fierce fighting and significant losses in Kopyansk and Lehman directions, the enemy is regrouping its forces and capabilities while transferring newly formed brigades and divisions from the territory of the Russian Federation. Ukrainian General Alexander uh, Sursky wrote on Telegram. Even while conducting its preparations, Russian troops continue to exert a powerful fire influence from artillery and mortars and are actively using aviation in their attacks, Sursky said, adding that Ukrainian forces are taking all measures to strengthen our defenses in threatened areas and move forward where possible. The operational situation in the eastern direction remains tense. He added to a, a failing offensive in the south and the prospect and reality of losing territory in the East all at the same time. This is a senior Ukrainian general talking about Russia putting new brigades and even regiments onto the battlefield. Is that something Ukraine is able to do? And apparently these are effective brigades and regiments because they're talking about powerful fire from artillery and mortars and also air power, which again, Ukraine does not have and will not have, even if the F-16s do come. Does that sound like Russia is nearing some sort of point of exhaustion the same way everyone is starting to admit Ukraine is? Does that seem like Russia is running low on ammunition or equipment or vehicles? Uh, it would seem to indicate the opposite, that they are getting stronger as this conflict continues. Toward the end of the article, it talks about F-16s. So again, they're trying to balance out this bad news uh, you, the Ukrainian offensive is doing poorly. Russia is beginning something that appears to be an offensive in the east, but F-16s are on the way. So it's more of this wonder weapon talk. And to be clear, they talk about Russian offensives. They talk about Ukrainian offensives. They're distinctively different. We see Ukraine uh, sending waves of tanks, other armored vehicles and troops toward Russian defenses that they have not in any significant way degraded. So they are running straight into fully prepared operational Russian defenses. That's why we see the losses that we see on the Ukrainian side. Russia, on the other hand, has long range fires of all, of all sorts superior to Ukraine's and they use this to their advantage to have a superior number of weapon systems and ammunition as well as air power and they are using this to degrade ukrainian defenses before finally moving in it's a very methodical time-consuming process but it works it is working so it's important to keep that in mind when they talk about you uh, russia going on the offensive they are not going to do it in the same way ukraine is doing it right now because they will also lose large numbers of men and equipment if they run their tanks and their infantry fighting vehicles, their armored personnel carriers into prepared Ukrainian defenses. No, they will use their long range fires to degrade them. So they're talking about F-16s. Let's talk a little bit about F-16s. Let's talk about Swedish made Griffin fighter jets. Let's talk about Ukrainian pilots and uh, the reality of Ukrainian air power as it stands right now and how it might look in the future. So let's start with this article by Forbes. Ukraine is getting F-16s. Now it needs cruise missiles by David Axe, uh, August 21st, 2023. Alex Christopher already went over this article pointing out that it's not even a sure bet that Ukraine is going to get these F-16s and then to suggest that they are going to get uh, these cruise missiles. They're referring to these uh, JSOMs, joint air to surface strike missile the idea that they're going to get these uh, is even more unlikely the article says the missile that might make the most difference the lockheed martin joint air to surface strike missile jason a two-ton stealthy cruise missile with a 230 mile range is still on kiev's wish list unless and until the United States approves the JSON for transfer to Ukraine, Ukrainian F-16s will fly short of their full potential. And again, their, their full potential is being destroyed on the ground before they even take off. And then at best being shot out of the sky by 
a Sukhoi Su-57 that doesn't even leave uh, Russia's pre-conflict borders, or it gets shot down by extensive Russian air defense systems all along the line of contact. That is its full potential. Uh, it, it could possibly, if it had cruise missiles of some sort, fire standoff weapons from very far away, and it might be able to do that uh, several times before then finally being destroyed. That is about as much as we can expect out of these F-16s, which is, is, is what Ukraine has been getting out of its original air force that it began this whole conflict with in the first place. It says, 10 weeks ago, Ukrainian ground forces launched a major counteroffensive along several axes in southern and eastern Ukraine. The goal of the southern efforts currently focused on the robotin tokmak Beledopol axis, as well as the mokri yali River Valley, is to drive Ukrainian brigades the 50 miles or so from the current front line to the Black Sea and sever Russia's ground lines of communication into Crimea. F-16s loaded with JSON could be critical to uh, the Ukrainian long-term plan to retake Crimea. There's two versions of JSONs. One is a uh, 370 kilometer range and an extended range version that is 925 kilometers. It's most likely they'll get the, the first rather than the second, if they get any of these at all. Uh, the problem is, there's a couple of problems with this. Number one, we already saw Ukraine receive high mars storm shadows they've they've used uh, a few remaining long range missiles that they themselves had on hand and none of this actually successfully cut russian lines of communication their logistics they have not successfully managed to do that with all of these other weapon systems that the us and the rest of nato gave ukraine and there's no likelihood that adding JSOMs fired by F-16s into the mix is going to finally achieve that. That is extremely unrealistic. That is not going to happen. The other problem is the U.S. is currently trying to build as many of these missiles as possible and stockpile them for a war with China that they're trying to provoke in the Pacific. So they have none of these missiles to spare for Ukraine. And uh, ironically, David Axe, the same author who wrote this Forbes piece, wrote another one uh, back in January of this year, 3,600 American cruise missiles versus the Chinese fleet. How one U.S. munition could decide Taiwan's fate. Well, considering David Axe's track record calling these things, I think we could uh, chalk that headline up to sensationalism. The article talks about this CSIS think tank war game conducted regarding U.S.-Chinese uh, fighting over Taiwan, and I've mentioned this this war game scenario in the past. I've talked about it extensively. Uh, David Axe in his article says, one weapon in particular was decisive in the scenarios where Taiwan and its allies prevailed. And when, when they say prevailed, they mean everything gets destroyed in the process, but, but they managed to stop uh, China from doing an amphibious landing on the island of Taiwan. It says, the American Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, JSOMS, a stealthy air-launched cruise missile that's compatible with an array of U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy warplanes. Specifically, it was the extended range, JSOM ER, ER, extended range, that helped to win the war by sinking most of the Chinese fleet over the course of two bloody weeks, starting with the first Chinese rocket barrage on Taiwanese bases. So they're talking about a war game. It also says, JSM er debuted in 2018. The U.S. Air Force is buying the new missiles as quickly as Lockheed can make them. CSIS projected the service would have more than 3,600 JSM er in 2026, the year in which Taiwan war games were set. And while that sounds like a lot, you have to remember that a lot of these missiles may never reach their target. They, they might fail to hit their target altogether. They may hit the target and fail to detonate. That is something that happens. Uh, but then you have others that would be intercepted by Chinese air defenses. Their air defenses are, are equal, perhaps even greater than Russian air defenses. A lot of their air defense systems are based on Russian systems, if not systems they have just simply bought from Russia, including the S-400. Uh, the aircraft carrying them may be intercepted before they even fire the missile. And then there's the fact that the places where these missiles are being stored, including on aircraft carriers, maybe they will be destroyed. 
in in these war games that these u.s think tanks carry out they usually do lose perhaps two or even three aircraft carriers throughout the course of the fighting so when you look at all of that even if they could manage to get 3600 missiles would that be enough would that be enough and the answer is no they want as many as they can possibly have on hand before any fighting starts which is a, a very clear incentive for them not to send them to ukraine and the same goes for attackums they would like to use those in a war they provoke with china rather than give them to ukraine where they're not going to make any difference if they were to give even a small number of jasons to ukraine uh information that russia learns in regards to intercepting them would then obviously be passed on to china there have been several JSMs used in Syria, so Russia may already have that information, and it may already have been passed to China. Uh, and again, as we've heard uh, from the Duran, Alex Christoforo, in his, his video about this article, this, these F-16s are a token gesture from the U.S., to Ukraine or from whoever's going to provide them to Ukraine, they're going to make absolutely no real difference in the outcome of the fighting. It's more about prolonging the conflict maybe a little bit longer, or maybe uh, the US attempting to bluff Russia. They constantly keep saying, we'll support Ukraine for as long as it takes. So they're running out of everything. And when they run out of something, they have to find something else to send to Ukraine. So sending F-16s is something that cannot actually effectively be used by Ukraine, but it's something that they can be seen transferring to Ukraine to manifest this concept of for as long as it takes. In addition to F-16s, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was in Sweden and he was asking for warplanes there, not F-16s, but Swedish made Griffin fighter jets. And this is from a Reuters article right here. Ukraine's Zelensky asked Sweden for Griffin jets in first visit since Russian invasion. This is from August 19th, 2023. There he is. Ukraine has begun discussing with Sweden the possibility of receiving Griffin jets to boost its air defenses, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said. The article mentions that Sweden needs all of its Griffin fighters to defend Swedish airspace, which seems like a very diplomatic way of saying no. But let's just say that let's just say that they do finally give in and they they, they want to send these Griffin fighter jets to Ukraine along with the F-16s. I want to point out how long this process actually really takes, how long it takes to do this properly, so that you can understand how unrealistic it is for Ukraine to ask for NATO aircraft and how unrealistic it is that these aircraft can be transferred to Ukraine and used effectively. And this is the same process that I followed regarding NATO main battle tanks. So we've seen how that's turned out in this current offensive. And this is exactly how it's going to turn out with these warplanes. So here's a, an article from the website of the company that actually makes the Griffin fighter jet. This is from 2011. Thailand receives first batch of Griffin fighters. The Royal Thai Air Force has now taken delivery of six Griffin CD fighters. These aircraft belong to the first batch ordered in 2008. In total, Thailand has ordered 12 Griffin. So six, it took three years for six aircraft to make it to Thailand. And it's not just the process of manufacturing these aircraft. It's also the process of training the pilots, training the maintenance crews that will maintain them, and also establishing the logistics in terms of spare parts and everything else that, that the fighter jet requires to operate on a regular basis. It takes that long. And I've explained how Ukraine took several years to integrate the Bayraktar TB2 drone into its uh, military from where it signed the contract to where the drones were delivered, there was a training process. And then there was a, a process where Ukraine figured out how they would actually use these in combat. And then finally they were used in combat and then they were all shot down. And we, know, we don't hear about Bayraktar TB2 drones in Ukraine anymore. So this is three years for Thailand signing a contract to receiving six jets. And then 
Uh, they say in total they ordered 12. Thailand currently has 11. So it's 2023. They, they signed a contract in 2008. They received six in 2011. Now they have 11 in total in the year 2023 because one, uh, one was destroyed in an accident because those things happen also. Speaking of accidents, there was a Ukrainian pilot, actually three Ukrainian pilots involved in an accident. Uh, he was he was a fairly well-known Ukrainian pilot. And here is the Guardian's article, Ukrainian pilot juice among three killed in jet collision, says Vladimir Zelensky. That this is the two L-39 training planes that crashed and were destroyed. And Juice, you may have heard me refer to him in the past when talking about the implausibility of sending Western warplanes to Ukraine and having them perform effectively in the airspace over the battlefield. He was one of these proponents pushing for F-16s and other Western warplanes. And I've seen a lot of pro-Ukrainian analysts and commentators blaming his death and the death of the two other Ukrainian pilots on the fact that the F-16s haven't been sent to Ukraine yet. And I've seen a lot of incoherent explanations as to why this is. They're saying that the F-16s would have been would have been far better, well, well maintained, far better than these Czech built L-39 training jets. But I, I want to lay out some realities here. Number one, accidents happen. They'll happen no matter what airplane, what what warplane you're flying, and no matter how well you try to maintain it, accidents still happen and people still die. That is the unfortunate nature of aviation. The argument that somehow F-16s are better maintained than these L-39s is is an absurdity when you really think about it. Who are the who are these warplanes being maintained by? If they're in Ukraine, who's maintaining them? Ukraine is maintaining them. And if they're not maintaining their L-39s, they're not going to maintain the F-16s you send them. It's worse still because the L-39s would have been planes that Ukrainian maintenance crews were more familiar with. They will be much less familiar with F-16s. And of, of course, I don't think anyone doubts that if these are sent, there most certainly will be Western maintenance crews involved in helping maintain them. The reality is Ukraine's air force is too small. The pool of pilots that exist to even fly any potential warplanes sent to Ukraine, that pool of pilots is too small. Uh, we were reading news stories about how they have to study English before they could even begin their training on the F-16s. This whole process is, is, is infeasible. It makes no sense to even attempt it. But again, this is part of kicking the can down the road and trying to manifest this concept of for as long as it takes. It's a token gesture being made because of a lack of actual support of substance that can be sent. There is no more left to give Ukraine. Now, getting back to the, the whole idea of sending Swedish Griffin fighters, that article from Reuters, uh, are also talking about other Swedish weapons that have been sent to Ukraine, including CV-90 infantry fighting vehicles, which were supposed to also perform very well on the battlefields, but but then they didn't. They were destroyed alongside everything else, the Bradleys, the, G the German Leopard 2s, the modern infantry fighting vehicles, US strikers are now starting to turn up, burning or stuck on the battlefield, and everything else. Uh, and the Reuters article goes on and it says, Ukraine and Sweden also signed an agreement which will see Ukraine begin production of Swedish CV-90 combat vehicles. So these CV-90 combat vehicles that are making absolutely no difference in the fighting, they're going to build a factory and manufacture these presumably in Ukraine. But this is very similar to Germany building a tank factory in Ukraine or Turkey building a Bayraktar drone factory in Ukraine, this is uh, this is all a fantasy. If any construction of any factory begins in Ukraine, Russia will just hit it with a cruise missile and it will be destroyed, just like the rest of Ukraine's military industrial capacity. That has been destroyed in the fighting since February 2022. The only way that this could possibly be viable is if the West created some sort of buffer zone in Western Ukraine where they would send their troops 
uh, establish it as a buffer zone and hope that Russia would not strike any target there. That, that's the only way that this might be plausible. And we've actually heard from the fringes of the, the Western political space talk of something sort of like this. Uh, I heard about this article from Alexander Mikuris of the Duran in one of his recent videos from the National Interest. This is from July 2023. Talk of NATO membership for Ukraine is a dangerous distraction. And in this article, it says former U.S. Congressman Tom Malinowski recently argued that Ukraine should just be granted membership in NATO without any further delay, despite admitting that such a course could easily lead to the alliance becoming an active belligerent in the war. Yes, because this would all depend on Russia not calling their bluff. And I think that they would at least partially do so. This goes back to why the U.S. is so desperate for Ukraine to transfer everything it has left to the South to try to make some sort of breakthrough in the South through these Russian defense lines. And this is just speculation on my part. This is just a, a possible theory as to why they might, might be so desperate to do this. They don't care what happens in the East. They know pretty much if things continue as they are right now, Ukraine is going to lose. They want this breakthrough in the South so that they could do something like this, where they could have Ukraine declare a unilateral ceasefire, be immediately incorporated into NATO and then given security guarantees and possibly creating this, this buffer zone in, what, in what, whatever remains of Ukrainian territory. Breaking through the Russian lines in the South in any sort of significant way, even if uh, in reality, it would mean the end of Ukraine's uh, combat potential, offensive potential at least, uh, leave their, their army decimated and precarious and vulnerable. But in that time window from where the breakthrough happens and when this unilateral ceasefire and NATO membership is supposed to unfold, the U.S. will point to this as Russian weakness and they will use this to uh, you know, diplomatically strong arm anyone who is working with Russia or maybe those who are already uh, siding with the West to, to deepen their support for this proxy war for Ukraine and for Ukraine NATO membership. This could be a, a possibility. This could be the method to their madness, attempting to make a breakthrough that otherwise, for all other intents and purposes, would just accelerate Ukraine's defeat. If Ukraine was a NATO member, if the U.S. and, and, and its allies moved troops into Ukraine and declared a, a buffer zone in what remained of Ukrainian territory, then you could start building these factories and trying to rebuild Ukraine's military. Uh, but again, this would all hinge on Russia not calling their bluff. So we're at a very critical juncture here in the conflict. It'll either continue to evolve in the complete collapse of Ukraine, which will which will take time. This is not something that's just going to happen overnight. Or the U.S. and their proxies are going to get more directly involved. They will intervene more directly. This, this is where we're, where we are. We're, we're at a point where this cannot continue as it is indefinitely. A decision is going to have to be made. So we have to keep a very close eye on this. I will continue watching this and breaking it down in future updates. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing, it's free to do and it helps the channel grow. Check out the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work, including on Telegram where I now upload uh, the full videos as a backup for YouTube. Uh, I use Telegram as my primary place where I post uh, all kinds of information, article links, videos, etc. Also in the video description are all of the links that I referenced in this video. So check those out. See for yourself what I'm talking about. There are also links in the video description below for ways you can help support my work. I don't monetize my YouTube channel. If an ad pops up anyway, feel free to skip it. It's not helping me out at all. If you do want to help support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. And to everyone who has been helping support my work, whether it's a one-time donation or donations month to month, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, all of that 
helps tremendously. It's what makes this work possible. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.